Hey guys, Matt here today, getting back into Colossians. Uh, I preached on this last night. I finished through 23. Today I'm going to hit 18 through 20. Tomorrow we'll do 21 through 23, and, and then we'll move on to the next section, 24 through 29. So yesterday we saw that Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together, verse 17. And I just want to encourage you, sometimes it doesn't feel like Jesus is holding all things together. Sometimes in this broken world, we have brokenness. Sometimes it's because of sin, before we met Jesus. Sometimes things happen even when we're in Jesus. Sometimes maybe we're not being faithful. Sometimes we're being faithful and it just happens. Be encouraged. Even if the wheels seem to be falling off, even if things seem to be unraveling and it doesn't feel like he's holding all things together, if you abide in him, you're going to be okay. He's going to show you that he is holding all things together. Right? He, remember Hebrews 13.5, never forget, Jesus will never, never, ever, under any circumstance, ever leave us or forsake us. That's how that verse literally translates. All right, moving right along. Today we're going to look at 18 through 20. I'm going to read through it. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Talking about the resurrection. So that in everything Jesus might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. And through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood, through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. All right. This is a powerful little passage. Paul again is pointing to the deity of Christ. He is God and he is the head of the body. We're the body, he's the head. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> Jesus was, God did not only make him the firstborn, he's the firstborn among the dead. He was the first to resurrect. Without the resurrection, you and I would be toast. Right? And it, it only makes sense that we're not going to be the res resurrected ones first. Jesus is the firstborn. He's going to be the first one to resurrect. It had to be that way. He, he rose from the dead. He died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And he was buried and he rose again, defeating death, defeating hell, defeating Satan. He is the victor. He won. It's over. It's finished. In all things, he has supremacy. Right? And therefore, he's the head. He's the head of the body. And what does Satan want to do? He wants to cut off the connection from the body to the head. You, you want to see somebody die? Cut off their head, right? A body can't live without the head. He knows that. So he, he, he knows he can't go after the head, so he goes after the body. He wants to strangle the body. He wants to chop it off. He wants to cut off the, the, the body from the head. That's the oldest trick. He's been doing it ever since God started his church. Right? So, so Jesus is the head. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. And he has supremacy in all things. Verse 19, for God, listen to this. This is a beautiful, beautiful verse. For God was pleased to have all, not some of, not part of, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. See, Jesus is God. All the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus, and it dwells in him still. He's God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's why Paul is telling this here, because there's false teachers that don't believe Jesus was God. These Gnostics believe that Jesus, if he walked down the beach, he wouldn't leave a trail because all matter was evil, and he couldn't, he couldn't have been a physical body, right? But he had to be a physical body. Why? Well, because... He had to reconcile all things to himself, whether things in heaven or things on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What kind of person could make peace by shedding blood on a cross? It's ridiculous. You can't make that up. Who does that? Right? Well, only a person who's God and man. Only a person who's a perfect sacrifice, who never sinned. Only a person who's not only the high priest, but the lamb, the sacrifice. He's both the priest and the offering. Only a person who's king and priest in the order of Melchizedek. Only Jesus Christ and only someone who is the fullness of God and man at the same time. It's a miracle. It's a beautiful thing. That's why there's, there's no longer enmity between us and God because he made peace through his blood. Right? So Jesus was God. He died on the cross. Verse 20, 
reconciling all things to himself, and the emergent church and other people like to take this verse to mean that all people go to heaven. It's not true. Why? Well, first we take the sentence, then we take the paragraph, then we take the letter, then we take the chapter, then we take the whole counsel of God, right? We, we use exegesis. We find out what the author is saying. We take it in context, right? We apply it to God's whole word. That's not what he's saying. Listen to this verse carefully. And through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Do you notice how he doesn't say things under the earth? Okay? No, no. He's not going to reconcile people in hell to himself to go to heaven. No, it's ridiculous. There's a, there's a literal judgment, right? Hell is real. Revelation, I think it's 20, verses 10 through 15. Jesus is going to, anybody who's not in the Lamb's Book of Life is going to be thrown in the lake of fire. It's a second judgment. He's going to take the people in Hades and put them in the, the lake of fire, right? And all the false prophets, all the Benny Hens of the world are going to be there, the liars and the false prophets and Satan himself. They're going to be in the lake of fire. Hell is real. And people that are in Hades right now waiting for eternal judgment are not going to be reconciled to God. Now, I want to point this out because this is a big deal. This was an interview with a guy named Doug Padgett. He's, he's uh, the local guy here in Minneapolis who teaches at Solomon's Porch. And he's a, an emergent. And many of these emergents believe that hell is not literal. Okay? And that all things are going to be reconciled to Jesus. That means all people. That means universalism. Todd Friel had an interview. and Todd Friel said... Uh, Mr. Padgett, when, when, what happens with good Muslims when they die? Well, what happens with good anything? There's no such thing as good anything apart from Christ. So he's asking him, what happens to a good Muslim when he dies? Here's Doug Padgett's answer. And listen to how Gnostic it is. Listen to how knowledgeable it is and how it kind of goes in circles. Listen to this. God's going to judge the life and repair and restore and heal the life of everybody in the same way. Okay? Did you understand that? No, it's it's just it's just universal gnostic nonsense, right? He he says that God's going to interact with Christians in the same way that he interacts with Muslims and Buddhists and atheists. He's going to interact with them in the same way. Interact because it's cool and it's hip and it's gnostic and it's garbage. Heaven is real, and hell is real. And Jesus is going to reconcile all things to himself, things on heaven and on earth. The checkbook is out of balance right now. Sin came in, Genesis 3, and we are now in a fallen world, and Jesus is going to reconcile that. He's going to balance the checkbook. He's going to put all things in their proper place. The lion's going to sit with the lamb. Right? We're not going to have cancer anymore. He's going to wipe away every tear. He's going to reconcile things to himself. Okay? The only reconciliation people in hell are going to get when they sit when they come before him for the final judgment to be thrown in the lake of fire. That's what that verse means. It does not teach universalism. All right? So those are two verses we looked at 15, 20, we'll look at 24 next week. But let's go back to real quick I want you to go back to verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness all his fullness dwell in Jesus, right? And who else does God want all His fullness to dwell in? You and I, right? We looked at this in Ephesians. Think about this. How would your life look right now today if you had all the fullness of God dwelling in you? That's what He wants. That's what Paul prays for in Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. All the fullness of God. How would our lives look? Think of it. Think of it. It's amazing. Now here's a question for you. Actually, I'm going to give you a question after this. Let me read this. I just decided I want to read this. This is Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. For this reason, this is a prayer for you. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Jesus Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, yes, you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses gnosis, that surpasses Gnostic knowledge, that surpasses knowledge, okay? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now listen to this. Listen to how he finishes. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power 
that works within us. To Him be the glory. To Him, okay, to Him who, who can do far more than we ask or think. Think of that. That'll blow your mind. So not only the things that we ask, you know those crazy prayers that you've thought, but they're so big you haven't even verbalized them? Yeah, those in your mind, He can do far more abundantly than those. Even the things you think. He wants to fill you with the fullness of God. And there's two reasons you don't have it. One, because you don't ask. Because you look at this prayer in Ephesians 3.14 and you think, gosh, that's a great prayer, Apostle Paul, in the first century, but that's not for us today. Let's go to chapter 4. We think that, but this is for us. So we, ha we, ask, we have not because we ask not. we got to ask for it. God wants to give us revelation. Apocalypto, opening of the eyes, more of Him, the fullness of Him. Not just, He didn't lavish, or He didn't sprinkle His grace out on us, Ephesians 2, right? Ephesians 1. He lavished it on us. He, God has so much more. We've got to ask. But now here's the, here's the second reason we might not have the fullness of God. And this is the challenging question I'm going to leave this video on. Here's the deal. Think about the fullness of God. Meditate on the fullness of God. Ask Him for the fullness of God. And if you don't have it, ask yourself this. What in your life right now, what in your life might be stopping God from giving you the fullness of Him? What besetting sin, what secret thing do you have in your life that has to go so that God can give you all of His fullness? Think about that. Is it a lust? Is it something you're doing in private? Is it something you're smoking or drinking or thinking? Or is it, a, is, it a, is, it, is it an improper love of money? On and on and on. Is it laziness? Not, not being spiritually hungry? What is it? What is it? What is getting in the way of God giving you all the fullness? Ask God to remove that and then ask Him to fill you. In Jesus' name, peace.